Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Uh, Not exactly feeling up to talking about myself today. There'll be another episode Thursday, so maybe I'll subject you to gill in progress then instead let's dive into this week's show now my guest this time around is the great comedian judy gold she has a brand new book out called yes i can say that subtitled when they come for the comedians we are all in trouble it's from day street an imprint of william morrow now the book has some memoirish qualities but but really it's all about what comedy is how our our culture of taking offense or political correctness is strangling it and and how that censorship can hurt us on a personal and societal level. Now, that's not to say this is some sort of dry discourse. Uh, Judy is a hilarious writer. Uh, she includes snippets of other comedians to illuminate her points, but also score tremendous laughs. Um, but it's a really thoughtful book, and it, it goes into how audiences have changed over the course of Judy's almost 40 year career in standup, how social media has has changed dynamics of, of what comics do, how cheap laughs give comedy a bad rap and, and how, as I put it in the show, uh, in the words of Judy's patron saint, Joan Rivers, we need to grow up. See, you know, while there's a debate, raging, at least in the Twitter sphere, about cancel culture and and also what's appropriate to joke about at the same time that we have federal troops and or private contractors abducting American citizens on, on U.S. soil. Judy reminds us that comedians have, have held an important cultural role throughout history and that putting arbitrary restrictions on them is a well, it's a slippery slope, and it leads to a, a less free society. Now, it's not to say that comedians have free license to say whatever they want. One of Judy's big points throughout the book is you better make it funny and you better be a professional. Going for cheap laughs, punching down, those are things that um, that ultimately don't serve the purpose of comedy. So, like I say, thoughtful but very, very funny book. Um, pick up Yes, I Can Say That and... You'll laugh a lot while also learning plenty about what well, about what comedy can do for a sick culture. Also, I really enjoyed Judy's podcast, Kill Me Now, which my wife turned me on to. So I was glad the book gave me an opportunity to record with her. Now, as caveats go, um, she came through loud and clear, but uh, there's a bunch of activity in the background. She's got a lot going on domestically. So, hey, also. I want to correct something that I said during the, the episode to come. Um, at one point, Judy asks me, based on how the last three years have, have three plus years have gone, whether Kathy Griffin would still have been canceled for the thing she got canceled over back in 2017, which was holding up that mask of, of Donald Trump with ketchup over it that looks like blood, decapitation, etc. In this podcast, I say no. After all, just look at NASCAR, NFL, and everybody else who's pushing back on Trump now. They're no longer scared of his tweets, etc. I, however, um, should have said Kathy Griffin is female, and as such, she would have been in for more heat than men. Um, so she still would have caught some flack, but I still think um, 
the mode of offense has changed in the last couple of years where uh, what she did would have been a 24 hour kerfluffle and soon disappeared. At least so I hope. Anyway, uh, that is me prattling on. Here's Judy's bio from her book. There's a much more extensive bio at her site, judygold.com. Judy Gold is an American stand-up comedian, actress, television writer, and producer. She won two Daytime Emmy Awards for her work as a writer and producer on The Rosie O'Donnell Show and has starred in comedy specials on HBO, Comedy Central, and Logo. She has also written and starred in two critically acclaimed off-Broadway hit shows, The Judy Show, My Life as a Sitcom, and 25 Questions for a Jewish Mother. She is currently the host of the hit podcast, Kill Me Now, and her new book is Yes, I Can Say That. When they come for the comedians, we are all in trouble. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Judy Gold. I look like an elongated Gene Wilder at this point, and I'll send you a picture that, that proves that. Uh, so it's Gene it's not Wilder pretty, but it's hair. Yeah, mine good is hair. Uh, it's it's pandemic Gene Wilder. That that's oh, probably right. the look I'm, I've been going for. I, I, I like to you. think it was you know getting more macho or or something, but really, yeah. this is what I look. You're like. You're not going to get way. macho with that, that voice too. that you have. Um, everything settled in the background. Yeah, guys, I'm trying to record something. I, Gil, I can't stand people. <laughs> like, I, I thought you get older well, and you get more, you know, tolerant of people, but it's just getting worse. Okay. No, what's been, what's been incredible for me is uh, I have had no problem transitioning into not interacting with anyone in person. I Outside know. Outside of my wife and my dog. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It I, You know what has happened, though? Gil, is that yeah. the not interacting with people thing is 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 so amazing that when I do interact with people, I can't stand them. Like people who I used to enjoy, I'm like, ew. You know, it's very interesting. Oh. Yeah, it, I don't know what the hell's no, going on. My big one was I went three months without setting foot in a building other than my house. And when I finally yeah, did, wow. it was my local post office. And one, I, I live in the town. I live in the house I grew up in. I live in the town right. I grew up in. And a person working in the post office I knew was going to be this this girl from high school that I knew. And I went in and hadn't had a face-to-face -face interaction with anyone for three months. Right. And I'm wearing a mask and sunglasses. And I realized she couldn't see the absolute distaste on my face. That right. I just all I wanted to do was leave and get out. Right. And I realized she can't even pick up on me <laughs> because I'm totally covered. This is terrible. I, know. <laughs> I, I that happens to me too. I'm like, oh, I'm safe now because I like I can't hold anything in. But you know, I'll be at the I'll be at the grocery store here. I'm in, I'm on the Cape, I'm in Provincetown, and I'll mm -hmm. go to the grocery store and I'll see someone you know, who I would normally, you know, nod or smile at and I'm smiling at them and I'm like, they're not reacting. And I'm like, Oh, right. I'm wearing a mask. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's also that yeah. every time I leave the house, it, it, it's like, wait, I'm forgetting. It's I'm, I'm always forgetting my mask. I, and I end as a performer, I'm actually doing shows here. I will put yeah. on my makeup. I'm going to ask I, about that. Yeah. I will put on my makeup, yeah. which I have, forgotten how to do but anyway and then right before i leave i put on lipstick and i'm i'm like what am i doing what am i doing i'm where i'm now putting on lipstick and then a mask you know well whatever so here we are it's pandemic life uh, yeah. the way i've put it like for me doing the show in person is the only way i've ever done it until mm -hmm. the pandemic time when i've had to do these remotes and i figure if that's the biggest inconvenience i have to deal with I'm getting off pretty easy. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are dealing with a lot of other crazier shit. I have to talk into a microphone in my office. Right. Not that bad. That's that's you know doable. But but let's get to the the book. I where did it begin for you? Uh, you mentioned in the foreword that you were asked to write about right. uh, free speech and and comedy. Where did it start for you from from that side? Like the I guess the publishing genesis, and then you know on a personal level, where did it begin? Uh, so. Harper Collins, an editor at Harper Collins, approached me after seeing me on a 
piece I was featured in for Vice TV about colleges, uh, uh, bookers at colleges telling comedians what they can and cannot say on stage. And so they interviewed these three bookers all in their twenties, which with a lot of life experience. Uh, And (laughs) they were all uh, saying that they were protecting the students. They're protecting the students. And it infuriated me. Uh, on such a visceral level. And I was actually the opposing, (laughs) the opposing side to this protecting the students thing. And um, I went on, they, they interviewed me and I also went on stage and did the most offensive material I I could, or (laughs) what I don't think is offensive, but what they would deem offensive. And, and it, it, it has gotten, You know, for me personally, you know, and writing this book, being asked to write this book and then going through all my research and and being being a comedian for so long and and seeing how we got to this point where we really could say anything. Uh, And now. People attacking comics for trying to make people laugh is it's it is beyond you know when when you don't take into consideration the intent of the comic and you just react to a word that you find uncomfortable you're doing everyone a disservice e- even when you murder when you commit homicide your sentence is determined by whether you had what your your intent was and you I mean, you consider it in in murder, but you don't consider it when a comic is writing a joke. It's ridiculous. And since when is it uh, unacceptable to feel uncomfortable? Like, what, what? Where did that come from? It's infuriating. Yeah, to me, that's one of the ironies is that cringe comedy became a thing over the last 15 years in that right. Gervais, Larry David, et cetera right. world. And at the same time, pe- people can't stand honest cringing you know right. re- really you know being made to squirm by by you know a statement that mm, i probably shouldn't laugh at that or i should question why i want to laugh at that right but you but, do yeah, where, anyway where you see it evolving um yeah. yeah it's it's just hard it's in the comedy clubs it's it's gotten you know there were people laughing and you know now it's more <laughs> You know, a lot of whoos and, <gasps> and it's, are you kidding me? We're in a comedy club. You know, we're supposed to, you know, go to the edge here. We're supposed to be making fun of nothing is sacred in a comedy club. And it's, you know, it's the only art form where we need an audience. That's the, that's the saddest part of it. You know, we, we, our work in progress is includes an audience and we don't sometimes like yeah. I'll sit here and think, Oh my God, this joke is so funny. I can't wait to get on stage and I'll go on stage and no one will laugh. And I'm like, are you kidding? I all day thought this was the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever, yeah. um, you know, said, but you know, a painter, Right, a painter does will 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 think of a masterpiece and start painting a masterpiece, and uh, it's as if the the painter is like, you know, an eighth of the way done with the painting. Is like, hey, I'm going to bring some people over. Let me know what. How do you think I'm doing on this painting? You think I should put a tree here? That's what we do. We we need the audience, but what's happening is that. It's now being said, you know, listen, if you're a painter, like, listen, you can't say you can't use the color blue, can't use the color blue anymore. It's done. It's politically incorrect. So no blue in your paint. You know, that's what it feels like. It's stifling. Do you see it as audience wide or is it younger audiences? And you mentioned the college thing on one side, but even in comedy right. clubs, does it seem generational as yes. to who is who is now the ooh crowd? One hundred and fifty percent. Yep. 
it is um it's so it's so interesting um i talk about in the book this uh that i was in a um i was playing tennis last year uh did you, I don't know if you read the book, but I, I was playing tennis last yeah. year and um, I, I live in Provincetown in the summer and they have carnival, which is a big parade and they always have a theme. So the theme was the eighties. And I said to one of these guys we were playing tennis with, you know, a gay guy, my age. Uh, in Provincetown? Both, yeah. I'm kidding. It's shocking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was like, wait, what are you doing here? Anyway, so he says, I can't believe you said I'm kidding. Like, I didn't know that. But you have to say that now. Anyway. I know. I, I, normally, <laughs> yes. That's, that's our point. <laughs> so we're playing tennis. We're talking, you know, people get dressed up for this parade. And and uh, and we were talking about, oh, it's the 80s. I said, oh, I'm going to get dressed up as a T-cell. And he was cracking. We were just cracking up, you know. And... He told me a week later when we were playing tennis that he told some younger um, friends of his what I had said, and they were appalled. And it's like, here's the deal. I lived through the AIDS crisis. I lost friends through the AIDS crisis. I watched people, you know, wither to, you know, it's just, you have no experience with that. Just like these college bookers have no life experience it's like and don't tell me what i am allowed to talk about or there's no growth without discourse when you start shutting people up that's the end of evolution as far as i'm concerned but it's like during the election there were there were young people saying oh i don't have to vote for hillary because you know, there's going to be a woman president in my time. Why does it have to be her in my lifetime? You know, why does it have to be her? And, you know, there's th- there are those people, and it's like, you haven't lived as a woman. <laughs> you don't know how hard it is. You've lived as a woman for, you know, 18, 19 years. And then on the other side of that is a, you know, you see these women who were 100 years old being brought to the polling uh, places saying, oh my God, I never thought I'd be able to vote for a woman in my lifetime. This is the greatest thing. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I just can't believe what's going on. It's like, and Gil, we go, we have now comedians being canceled and a president who says the most abhorrent, dangerous things and right. continues to do so. Well, like, that's uh, the question yeah. that, that comes up through the book is the concern, the cancel side of things is more the, the progressive left wing left. side of this world yes. that's yep. that's a, a danger than the the right. I mean, you get the anti Kathy Griffin thing, which was bullshit, right. we know, but, you know, the, they have a fake outrage that they, they leverage to do right. this stuff. But, it's you know, like, again, from the. Right. It's like. The, <laughs> I have a question for you. Do you think yeah. with all that, the amount of people that Trump has killed on his watch and, and you know, mm-hmm. for his no leadership, that if Kathy Griffin did that today, it would have the same. I wonder if it would have the same. No, no, we're we're near it on both sides. Yeah. Like on the one side, you know, for me, it's the way like the way businesses, NASCAR and the NFL and everybody yeah. are now siding with the Black Lives Matter thing. That couldn't have happened in 2017. Right, they were exactly. too scared. Of now they recognize the tweets don't matter. They don't impact our businesses at all. We can do things that at least pay lip service to, to social right. good um, in a way that they, you know, they couldn't a couple of years ago. Um, I think, you know, that, that's what right. it looks like from being a, a schlubby Jew in New Jersey, um, yes. <laughs> where I'm, I'm, I'm hiding out. Oh, um, I'm, yeah, that's I'm a Jew, schlubby Jew from New Jersey as well. I know. That's why I, one oh. of the first things I had written down in my notes was, are you from Jersey? I'm from yes. Jersey. I had yeah. the, the Joe Piscopo <laughs> thing, you know, from, from old SNL. <laughs> yeah, right. Which, you know, yeah, probably I'm, I'm, I'm you, couldn't do, you, you couldn't do now because all, oh my God, it's offensive to people from Jersey, you know. Right. Oh, oh my God. It's, For it's, me, yeah. the, only, the only offensive thing is whether you define central Jersey. 
as a thing. There's North Jersey yeah. and South Jersey, and they're trying to define Central Jersey as a thing, but it's like fetch. You know, you just Where, can't make what, that happen. What part I, I of really Jersey believe. are you? I grew up in Central. So I'm North. I'm, I'm north. north. I'm, yeah. I'm 25 miles north and west of the bridge, Passaic mm-hmm. County, on the corner of Bergen County, out right. in the woods. Uh, my my parents moved here in 68, and I just kind of managed to stay, which is weird. But, you know, it's uh, funny because my, my parents moved in 68, too, from Elizabeth to Clark. So, yeah. You're moving really on up fun. to the Jeffersons theme. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> But that question, though, before we get to the left right thing, there's the issue of who can make a joke and who can't that right. resonates with something that happened with the show, with this podcast years ago. I did a live episode with this. It was a panel. And one of the guys was the author of a book, German guy, uh, that the novel Always was funny. about Hitler. Yeah. Well, what's great is Hitler wakes up in modern day Germany and has no idea why, um, doesn't know what happened. And starts to make his way in present day Germany. Right. Everybody thinks he's a Hitler impersonator and he ends up getting a reality show. They think he's a comedian, but he's taking it totally seriously, right. not realizing everybody thinks he's a comedian. Ends up getting his ass beat by a bunch of right wingers who think he's making right. fun of Hitler too much. Right. But over the course of the panel, you know, I mentioned that, well, you know, with us all being Jewish, you know, we can make those jokes. And the author said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not Jewish. <gasps> And all of a sudden, yeah, see, all of a sudden I had this moment of, wait a second, I can laugh at your Hitler jokes when right. you were, when I thought you were Jewish. I'm not sure they're as funny now. Right, exactly. And it was, I never encountered that. But yeah, you talk about that in terms of, like you said, with the, the, the T-cell joke, who can tell a joke and who can't right. and whether that becomes a slippery slope of, again, leading you into – to you're not allowed to make this joke, but the other guy is. Well, you know, there are certain things we own. Like, I cannot say the N-word, nor right. do I ever want to. That is not my word to say. Um, and it is, it's very interesting that, you know, we we can discuss and 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 use humor to discuss subversive topics. I mean, I have Holocaust jokes, um, but I'm, I'm coming from a, from someone who, I mean, I wasn't, of course, in the Holocaust, but s- grew up with knowledge and embedded in my, in, in our every moment, you know, they hate us, they all yeah. hate us. Uh, it can happen again, don't forget. Watch this video. Watch these films. He, look at look at you know my best friend's arm and the numbers on her arm. You know, this is what I I know. You know, that's really because you don't know what his point of yeah. view is. How can you have a point of view like that? That's really. That's, I know, it, and that's it's a funny issue. novel. Right. But it becomes a, maybe he does have family. It wasn't just Jews. Maybe there is some family history. That, right, that's right, right. But, but yeah, it was a weird uh, moment for me. I'm was, sitting in front of a crowd and I had to be entertaining. And I was right. like, wow, I know this. It really gets you. It, it's like a knife in your heart. It's, it's uh, you know, if he was, um, you know, Schindler's, net, you know, great grandson yeah. or it, fine, you know? Yeah. Or could have been um, other ethnic groups that were that were hunted down too. But, right, right. You know, it it also led to the question yeah. of, yeah. Do you remember the the first time you laughed at at Nazis or Hitler? I assume it's a Mel Brooks thing for for oh, all of please, us. Oh, please, of course, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Which became a question during the the panel. I had to ask. Yeah. Anybody remember the first time they laughed at Nazis? And, yeah. So, and it's so funny know. because you know, it's documented that that prison you know, prisoners in the Holocaust who were in concentration camps were putting on shows for each other. You know, there is that term that the gallows humor that it it's so dark and ornery. There's nothing, there's no other option besides laughing. Yeah. That's why when I recorded with Bruce J. Friedman years ago, one of my, my all time faves, it was the, you know, where did the black comedy come from? It's like, we're right. Jews. Where was it supposed right. to come from? This right. is, you know, <laughs> this is what we do. Right. 
But, um, now, are you pickier about venues where you perform now because of the, you know, the college thing on the one side and just audience yeah. sensitivities or how has it impacted, you know, your stand up? I guess. Well, it, it's, it's different. Like when, when you've been doing it a really long time and then people come to see you, you know, when you're in yeah. a venue where, you know, you people are coming, you're okay. You're usually okay. Cause they know what to expect. But when you're, uh, in, in a venue that you haven't been in before or, uh, in a new town and people are like, Oh, I'll just, you know, you know, people want a ticket on a radio show. Um, it's not, <laughs> it can be really dicey. Uh, but I do, because I've been doing this for so long, I know what rooms I'm, you know, I'm going to succeed in. And I also know, you know, when I walk into a smaller theater or a, a theater type setting or a cabaret type setting, it's such a different vibe for me than a comedy club because I feel like in a theater or a cabaret, which the ticket prices are notoriously higher, but it's also that, you know, there's a difference when you're in a, a performer in a theater on a stage in a theater, you get, people are sitting, waiting, they're, they're attentive. So it's sort of like you yeah. want to keep their attention. And so many times in a comedy club, you have to get their attention. Um, and I, I don't want to have to chase that or, you know, feel like, okay, I, I got to fight my way into this. I've done, I've done all, I've paid my dues and done all my fighting. Um, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's different, but look, I, I, if I hadn't have gone, gone on the road and dealt with hostile audiences and anti-Semitism and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't be as good a comic as I am. Yeah. What do you feel you got better at? Was there a moment where you felt like you'd, you'd turned the corner performing? I, yeah, there's, I think there's many corners. I think that, you know, you know, you have befores and afters in your life, you know, before a parent dies, mm -hmm. after a parent, you know, tragedies and, and other rites of passage. So I feel that uh, there are times, I think the biggest shift for me was once I hit my late forties and, and into my fifties, I didn't care anymore. You know, it was as if there's nothing you can say to me that <laughs> I haven't heard before. <laughs> you know, I, I don't care. It's like, I realized I got to the point where, cause the business is so horrible. I mean, a woman, in her late forties in stand up is invisible, you know. Um yeah. you know, I've been told I can't get a Netflix special because I don't fit the algorithm. And I had no idea <laughs> that laughter had an algorithm, but it does. So you know yeah. I feel that once you don't give a shit you're so much funnier. And I, I also, because I had been up and down and up and down, um, I'm working, I'm not working. I really learned to love stand up. And also I know that I can, it's my home. It's like, I can go back, you know, I always thought, Oh, I'm going to get on a TV show and I'm going to, be hosting this and I'll just do stand up every now and then. And, you know, it'll be a stepping stone to something else, but it never, it was always my favorite part of performing was doing the stand up part. <laughs> and once I just said to myself, stand up is enough that that's what you do. And it's fine. You don't have to be, you know, a, a, a movie star. You can yeah. love yeah. what you do. And, and I, I do, I, I mean, I love it. I crave it. I sleep better when I do a set. Um, I walk into the comedy cellar. I feel like, you know, I'm with my family. I'm home. It's sometimes I pinch myself. Well, when I used to take the subway, you know, I'd be like, you know, I'm 57 yeah. years old. I've been doing this for like over 35 years, I pinch my, I'm like, I'm still on the subway with my notebook at nine 30 at night. You know, there's people in nursing homes who are my age. 
Yeah. Now, does the – well, I, I have no idea if you have any history or if it's going to be weird to bring up his name, but someone like Leno, who was still doing like 100-plus shows a year while yes. doing The Tonight Show, right. is it pathological at that point? Or is it just I, I an extension he, of what you're talking about? Yeah, I think it's an extension of – he. that's his job. I mean – and he loves it. Uh, and I have to, I did his show three times. Lovely, lovely man. Um, just, he's a comedian. Like, that's what he, he's, he's hosting the show. It just shows you that even though he doesn't have to do that, he does it because that is his livelihood. That is his craft. That's what he does. Um, it's like, uh, uh, here's a name we're not supposed to discuss, but like Woody Allen still writing movies into his eighties. Um, I mean, it's, it's the thing you do. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's their lifeblood. And you got to perform in his, his Amazon series, right? Or was it Amazon? Uh, he oh, did, I did. He did yeah, a, that I short performed, uh, this movie. is before all of the, horrendous stuff but um, the latest round of yes yeah. uh i did i was in crisis and six scenes yeah you know it's so funny because people are always like oh, i would never work for him and blah 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 you know i'd love the luxury to be able to say yeah now i'm uh, yeah i'm gonna turn that down because uh <laughs> it, it's yeah people work are like oh would you ever work I, I i can't say no to work i'm not meryl streep I mean, I look like her, but yeah. although I was just about to say, with the hair, with the the yes, height, you know, if yes, you, if, you, if you added six inches to yeah. her, but yeah, anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but yet, can you? It's it's to me, it's one of the toughest parts of this whole era that we're in, and it's something you wrestle with in, in the book. What cancel culture means exactly? Right. Or who who deserves being cut off? And I mean, you, you cite Bill Cosby as the you know the felony statute is enough to say yes, this person should be out of circulation. Right, right. Um, Which is yeah, sad, you know. For, you know, it's sad that he's yeah. a sexual predator, rapist, disgusting human being because yeah. his show is was that you know, it, it, and it was so interesting because you you mentioned Bill Cosby, and I, I talk about how. I was in a car when this whole thing was happening. There were people, I can't, no, there's no way. There's no way he did it. And I was like, Dr. Huxtable didn't do it. Bill Cosby did it. It's right. like they couldn't separate the two. Yeah, that's, that's in a sense, I mean, that's one of the, the weirder cancellations that happened a few years ago with Aziz Ansari, who right. apparently had a not so great date. date. With it someone who anonymously right. complained. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. not really ground for destroying a dude's career. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, I, I, and anonymous? Come on. I, yeah. I don't know. that that I was reading that going, okay, and, 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 yeah. you know, you went back to the and apartment. And not, yeah. Yeah, that, that's part of the, that's why I tend not to weigh in on these things. Yeah. Because... We're older, I guess, right. and maybe come from a different generation about this stuff. I'm, right. I'm uh, 10 years younger than you, so uh, oh I'll be 50. Oh, my God. Soon. Why are you showing off? <laughs> if, if, I, if I sent you the, um, the weird Twitter feed I've, I've been doing over the past week, Matthew Reese, the, the actor from The Americans and yes. Perry Mason, started this uh, 25 push-ups a day for 30 days raise awareness for men's mental health thing. Right. And I thought, yeah, I haven't done push-ups in my life. Let me try that. And um, that's actually turned into a thing between that and taking up running two years ago. I'm like, I'm the fittest 50-year-old guy there is. Yeah. Um, you know, okay, I'll, I'll if you're 50, you're older, only seven. But... How old are you? 50? Uh, I'll be, I'm 49. So born in 71. So. Okay. Well, whatever. You're eight years younger than me. So don't even start. Yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm, but we still come from a different generation I right. think oh, in yeah, terms absolutely. Of, well, of, of, and yeah. this, this idea of, you know, I, I believe, you know, I'm sure you read the coddling of the American mind. I mean, this idea mm -hmm. of 
everyone gets a trophy. This, you know, you won the tournament, but you were smiling when he won. So you get a trophy too. I mean, what is that? Yeah. What is that? No, that's not the real world. I, I recently wrote something and I, and I, I said, you know, and they, they've created, you know, we're in a safe space. So you don't worry. You're not going to feel uncomfortable here. Every safe, safe space has a door that leads to the real outside world. You know, what are we prepping people for? Just cry, walking down the street crying? Oh, my God. I'm, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. I told a pal of mine, she's a professor at NYU and has to deal with kids whose parents come in to complain about their kids' grades, that I said, you know, I, I get that they've got the uh, the helicopter parents who are always there right. and they're being protected all their lives. We have to figure out some way to make money off of that. And she eventually did by tutoring those kids in like high school to prepare them for, for going to places like right. NYU right. because they are totally, for all the academic achievement, totally unprepared for right. social as you said the real world right yeah and and it's so funny because you know you can get a perfect score on your sats but that doesn't mean you can have a conversation with a stranger you know um and we don't we don't measure uh emotional intelligence in this country or or value it as much as we should i think i mean look at the fucking president he has zero emotional intelligence yeah. I'm with you. So where does comedy go from here? Yeah. If if we're getting too old and, and I know, the, the flip side I know. of this, my wife and I have tried watching younger comedians and I'm not going to ask you to, to slag anybody. We've tried watching stand up with younger comedians mm -hmm. and it's, it's like they're speaking an alien language. Right. And then we turn on like a Tom Papa special yeah. and it's like, Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're old. Right. <laughs> we're we're going to watch this instead. So, but it, um, I do. That's, go? That there are some great younger comics, um, but you know, the more life experience you have, the better comedian you're gonna be because, and more to talk about. You know, you have to have a life in order to talk about it. But um, th there's so many layers to that question because, you know, you could say, you know, for for female comics, for women comics, you know, we still have shows that when three women are on a show, it's a special event or ladies night out or hysterical or stilettos, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so there's that element. When three guys are on a show, it's a show. When three women are on a show, it's a special event. So that needs to stop. When there's three people of color on a show, it's an urban show and not a regular a show. show. So that yeah. needs to stop. Um, but it's so funny because right now, at this time, it's sort of the perfect storm for stand-up because we're all thinking the same thing. We're all in the same boat. So, you know, it's like we know what we want to talk about on stage. And the fact that you are... Like like I talk about Don Rickles, but thank God he's dead. Oh. And he he was alive when he was alive because, you know, that caustic warmth that everyone knew what he meant when he was, you know, just leveling everyone out. Like, oh, you're this, you're that. We're all the same. You know, laugh at yourself. Laugh. Like, when did we stop? We have to start laughing at it. I mean, and stop taking ourselves so fucking seriously. It's... Well, that's it's the, the primary message of the book, I, I think, right. you know, you, you come at the very end to Joan Rivers, your your hero. Right. But it seems like she had the, the message that everybody needs, which is just two words. Grow up. Grow up. That was up. always her 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 kicker line there. And, and really, yeah, they haven't you grown know, up. When you hang out with a bunch of comics, when, when we're all sitting at the comedy cellar after our sets or waiting to go on, we are so abusive to each other. <laughs> I mean, it is every little thing about nothing is sacred. And we laugh like you cannot believe. And to be mocked, you know, for for Trump to want to, you know, investigate Saturday Night Live, right? <laughs> and 
it, it, to me, if some, if they, if Saturday Night Live said we're gonna do a skit about Judy Gold, I, I would be like, oh my god, I made it! I can't <laughs> believe it, you know. Yeah. It's it, comedy is so disarming, and it is really it's it's a way to bring people together. It's a way of uniting us. It's a way of you know when I came out on stage in the mid nineties, I came out as a gay parent. Um, I started doing material about my family because every comic talks about their family. I'm going to talk about being, you know, having kids and being in a same sex relationship. And after a minute or two, all these straight people in the audience were like, Oh my God, their family's exactly like ours. I mean, I had a guy in Houston (laughs) come up to me and say, you know, he was a, in the service too. And he said, I kind of see why you, I see now why you, you want to get married. I get it now makes a lot of sense. I mean, from a stand-up act, so that maybe when he goes to vote, you know, from from just seeing yeah. a comedian that made you laugh who you like, you know, when these there's comics who are sons and daughters of immigrants, you know, and them talking about that experience, what it's like. There's comics who are disabled who get on stage and break the stigma. Um, it's such a powerful medium. And to stifle it by saying you can't say these certain words because it offends me. (laughs) It's just, it's so un-American. It's so un-American. I mean, think about Bob Hope, you know, these during world war two, he went to these, you know, in the middle of a fucking horrible war or as Trump would say, a beautiful war, beautiful war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) What is he doing? He's going and getting these soldiers together and making them laugh. You know, that it's a uniter. It it's alleviates stress. It, there's so many great things about it. And when you stop, when you silence comedians, because we are the truth tellers, then, you know, there goes your, there goes the first amendment. Yeah. And yeah, when did you feel that? That I don't want to say responsibility, but you know that power. I guess when did it occur to you? Was it in the? I you know everybody talks about you know Carlin and Pryor and those guys right. sort of you know opening up their world, right? Um, and that being the 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 moment for him. Do, do you remember a particular? Yeah, this is what I'm doing, and it's not just about getting a cheap laugh. It's about something bigger. I think it was. Uh, yeah, I think it was. Probably, I think the AIDS crisis had a lot to do with it. And Mm -hmm. I do think it was being a parent um, and having children who are like, wait, why can't you get married? Or what do I write on this form at school? It says mother and father, you know, and also 9-11. You know, I, I remember communicating with Christine Quinn and saying, listen, the kid, you know, Henry, my older son was just starting kindergarten and first grade. And, and the forms were all every school form in a public school was mother and father. And she's like, Oh, we, I can't, we have to change that, which she did. She was instrumental in doing that, but it wasn't just about that. You know, I'm gay. It was about that. So many kids lost their parents, a parent in nine 11, there are kids with parents who are incarcerated there, you know, there's, we, those are things, those are changes where you write parent and guardian on a form that are universal and they take care of something or make people's families valid. And I feel like once you have kids and you see, it's not about you anymore, you know, and you yeah. see the world in a different way. And you, it, it, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like I, I've always hated injustice and inequality, but now the fact that it, it makes me even crazier that you're like, no, you can't say that. I can say that. And if you don't like it, you can a leave B change the channel C turn off the radio, you know? If you don't like your kids, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Are are your kids any sort of barometer 
for that? Do they give you any insight into what younger people, why younger people behave the way they do? You know, they're so, (laughs) they're so different because A, they've grown up around a comic. So (laughs) everything. They've got you. Yeah. Right. So (laughs) it was always, and I, we had this rule in the family, like you could say anything mean and disrespectful. And if it was, you know, you won't get in trouble if it's funny, you know, it really (laughs) funny was (laughs) very valued. Um, And I think that I, I had them. And to so many other kids, parents were like, I can't believe you let, you know, your kids watch this, but I, we would watch South park and uh, when they were little and family guy, I didn't want to shield them you know, or for them to think everything, oh, that's taboo. We can't talk about it. We can't talk because you know that when you don't talk about things, you know, as a Jew, you know, yeah. we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> you know, that it doesn't make it go away. It makes it worse. You know, so I, in the, and during the age of silence does equal death. And I, I, that, I really took that to heart. And look, look what's happening with Black Lives Matter. If we didn't have those phones, uh, the cameras on our phones... I mean, this has been going on forever, right. and now it's documented. It's like we tried to tell you, but now we have to shove it into your face because you're a fucking idiot, you know. Um, but I feel like so- when we silent, that's what happened in Nazi Germany with the books and the. I mean, it's getting so ridiculous that that um, to kill a mockingbird, you can't re. I mean, are you kidding? You can't erase our history. It's doesn't it, don't you get, don't you, doesn't it make you, I mean, my mother, as my mother used to say, Judith, I don't know why you're getting your blood pressure up, but (laughs) that's what she used to say to me. When do you have to get your blood pressure up? But I just, it makes me, it, it makes satire is, I mean, I live for the Borowitz report. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) Uh, I mean, you talk about watching with the, the kids. My parents took me to History of the World Part One when I was eight. Oh, nine. I love your parents. Yeah. See, they, to them, there was nothing wrong with that. Right. And we, we were watching things at, at home on my father's bootleg uh, cable uh, right. theft practice. So I was seeing, you know, Blazing Saddles and things like that right. long before I, I got what the jokes were. But uh, Animal House, same thing. I watched that like, you right. know, as it was coming out and it was just... I'm nine. I'm not sure this is exactly what I should be. Whatever. This this is helping warp my my sense of humor. Right. And you but, have a sense of humor. You yeah. know, and and my kids, um, it, it got to the point where we would be watching something, you know, when they started developing, you know, animated shows where there were jokes in it for the adults and jokes in it for the kids. Um, when I would laugh at something they would they would say so you're laughing at that because blank like they started understanding about a sense of humor and what was funny about you know as a comic there's comics that don't make me laugh but i can say i can understand why you know other people are laughing because it is a sense it's like you either it's like a sense of taste you either like salty food or you don't like salty food you either understand sarcasm or you don't understand sarcasm um you know, I don't laugh at slipping on a banana peel. I do laugh at at um, what you call it, uh, uh, Mo Curly, uh, oh, the Three Stooges. Three yeah. Stooges. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a bit they did. I think it was the first banana peel bit where they they're <laughs> playing football with these football players, and they start just throwing banana peels on the ground, and all the football players are just falling. I mean, that is funny, but, you know, um, that's the first time I think it was ever used. It was hilarious. But, you know, then we, of course, in, we're in America, so we have to Run overdo the things yeah. over, over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually strikes me. It's something I hadn't thought about. But when you're watching stand up, how much are you looking at it with like a technical eye or ear? Like, and, uh, are you breaking down what they're doing while they're doing it? Or are you able to kind of take it in yeah. you know, as an audience? I mean, sometimes you're watching it going, oh, my God, I'm so jealous. I didn't write that joke. Um, you know, I watched Wanda Sykes special 
And I oh. was just hysterically laughing. Like when she's talking about Trump, she's talking about, you know, when people came to her show and she started talking about Trump and then they walked out. Right. You know, it, it was so hilarious. And it was also like, she's like, well, you made two mistakes, you know? Yeah, you actually um, put that in the book and I, yeah. I died laughing over it. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's sometimes, you know, that people that make you belly laugh and you're just like, oh my God. Um, and then there are times where, you know, people write amazing jokes. Like there's a comic, Sam Morell, who is... He's in his thirties. He is such a brilliant writer. And I, uh, I just love his writing, you know, there's, but yes, there are, I do watch and, you know, I know the tricks I know, yeah. um, you know, I've seen everyone pretty much perform. I mean, except for some young people, <laughs> um, but I, I get it. Yeah. So I do. It's like you when you listen to an interview or read a book or, you know, or review well, that's a That's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. I yeah. tear people to pieces when I watch them interview someone and right. fuck up. I'm right. like, oh, God, that's exactly where you should have asked X. Right. And you didn't do it. So, yeah. yeah. And I'll be like, fact, oh, my God, you could have gone here or you should have said that or you could have had a tagline. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. then again, I don't watch a lot of stand up because it drives me up, you know. It's like, yeah. you know, when, I don't know if people, people will call me and say, hey, so-and-so is performing, though, you want to go? I'm like, no, that's like, you know, you going to your accounting office and doing someone's taxes, you know? <laughs> do you want to watch this guy do some taxes? Yeah, man, yeah. let's go. Yeah, that's someone. That's... Someone, someone actually <laughs> said, a physical therapist said, do you, oh, we're going to see that you want, we have tickets, do you want to go? And I was like, that would be like me asking you to go watch someone teach some watch someone teach them uh, you know a patient their hip exercises you know <laughs> and he, he was like oh yeah okay i got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but again what you do is so easy or you know everybody's got that that here i got a joke for you that that sort oh, of thing That's that right. gil i'm telling you the th <laughs> because we <laughs> Because we get on stage and are so personal and people know so much about us um, and draw from our own life, people think that after the show, thank this is the one good thing about the pandemic. No meet and greets after the show. Um, people <laughs> will come up to you after the show and start telling you personal stuff or, oh, do you know this? Oh, I have a joke. You can use it. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> It's it's unbelievable what people think they can say to you. Because you're you're out there and, and as you write in the book, they think that's the the authentic you or the right. only you. Right. There's a chapter yeah. uh entitled There's a reason it's called an act. Um yeah. and it's as much of who we are is in it, you know, in our act and, and a part of it. We, I don't sit here and get up in the morning and say to, you know, my, my partner, Lisa, Hey, good morning. How, how are things? How you doing? Where'd you come in from? You know, I, it's, it, we, great we to be a, here in Provincetown. Yeah, yeah, great to be here in Provincetown. <laughs> hey, hey, you want to go downstairs and uh, let's make some coffee? Whoa, wow, this coffee is, but it's, yeah. it's, it's also, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like you want to be re you you want to be really nice to everyone. Um, you want to because they're your fans. But like sometimes you just realize how stupid people are. Plus the other thing that is really annoying about being stand up that people uh, stand up uh, stand up company mm -hmm. that people say, oh oh big deal. You you what would you go on stage for a half an hour? Or you work for a half hour a night. You work for an hour a night. It's like <laughs> I work twenty four hours that you live in my head. How about that? That's a fucking job right there. Or even putting together an hour of material. Oh. That was, it was that, uh, there was an HBO thing with, uh, God, Gervais, Chris Rock, Seinfeld, and Louie. Right. 
and how Chris all Rock men, talked about men, coming up men, with two. All men, all men. Well, yeah. there's that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Rock talked about having to do two hours every year. Because right. he said, I don't have Seinfeld money. I don't have office money. I've got to right. come up with, you know, two hours so I can go, go tour. Right. You know, that's. Yeah. Now, now you get, you do a special. I mean, I, part, I'm so resentful that, you know, I can't get a Netflix special, but then I'm thinking, well, you know, I can still do that material. Um, it, it does, it, you know, years ago before all of this in the Catskill, I mean, you'd hear these, uh, these acts doing their same jokes over and over. Um, and it's so, it's the whole difference between stand up and music. Like I, you know, Billy Joel <laughs> has been living off the same album and he yeah. goes on tour and people just want to hear those songs over and over again, but people do not want to hear your jokes over and over again. And that is, it's a lot of work and two hours a year is a lot. Yeah. Well, I know for most guys, it's the hour or so, but for, for Chris Rock, I think it's, uh, it was supposed to be the, I've got to do these almost stadium level. Right. Right. Of shows, course. And that yeah, they're going to feel ripped off if I go up there and you know yes. I'm down 70 minutes later. It's also like, but, um, you know what's interesting is when you say that about the stadiums and it's like there's something so intimate about stand up and yeah. yet there's so many comics who do Madison Square Garden well when we were allowed to go but right and huge the before stadium. time yeah. yeah and it to me there's something it's like zoom it's like there's a delay there's a I don't know I I love intimate small rooms but that's just me. And that's why, oh, and, make, that's why I make so much money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why this, this format, like I was saying at the beginning, kills me. The fact that we're not sitting at a table face to face talking, right? we lose something in the process. But I remember, I think it was Steve Martin back in the seventies or early eighties, like the first time he went out and it was 20,000 people or something. And he mm -hmm. had that moment of, holy shit, what do right. I do? Like, it's just, you can't even see all the people when you're used to, at most, a theater, but generally, you know, a basement right. comedy club. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, so don't, don't, don't go huge. No, no Dane Cook for you. That's, that's no, what I'm saying. Judy. No, no, don't, no. Don't. And it's also like, I feel like you have to be so big and I, I don't know. I, yeah. But I guess certain people can do it. I mean, Chris Rock is great at it. He's so great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, yeah. come now, on. A part of me is like, I wish I could still out, sell out a stadium, you know. But it's sure. good now with the pandemic that we were like a halfway full or a third way full. I'll actually start selling out theaters. I was going to ask, <laughs> you started performing again? Yes. Up in, in Provincetown? Yeah. Are you... We're outside. What is it like? Poolside. Ooh. It's outdoors. Yeah. The tables are so far away from each other. Um. But I have to say, hearing laughter live, having a give and take with the audience, there is nothing that compares to live performance. Nothing. Zero. You know, you watch PBS when they'll show, um, I mean, they just showed Disney, just showed Hamilton, you know. But when you, you watch yeah. theater on TV, there's something missing, you know. Um, yeah. and it's just to be doing that and being in the moment and, it, oh, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. I just love it. I miss how it. How long, how long did you go between shows? Was this the longest you've gone without Absolutely. being able to get out in front of a crowd? Yep. Okay. Um, when we, we were all, I was talking to a bunch of comics. We're all like, we're all going to suck. We're going to be so rusty. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my next question. Yeah. What did you have to relearn? You know? you know, it's funny. You start going back to your jokes and thinking, wait, wait, I forgot this part of the joke. You know, I forgot. Oh, this comes after that. Oh yeah. I did that bit. Oh, oh, right. You know, and then you're like, oh my God, it's, it's, yeah, it's like relearning something, but um, it also forces you to write new stuff. But I I'd say I did my last gig. Um, it was Mar. I was in Minneapolis, and I guess it was March. I'm looking at my calendar while we talk. Um, 
That's I'm watching porn. It's okay. I'm no, just that's kidding. fine. Okay. Oh, good. You can write a bit about that. <laughs> that's what you should talk about on. That's all they talk about. It's like that's the thing. That is the thing that everyone talks well, about. That's sort of what in the twenty. I, I hit up. A bunch of New Yorker cartoonists I've recorded with, and they were like, it's really tough, especially in that April, May stretch this year, yeah. coming up with gags that didn't involve toilet paper right. or protective gear. Right, and it right, was like, right. yeah, we tried to come up with jokes that weren't the same joke that everyone else is pitching. So, Right. I did, let's see, I did March 9th uh, was my last set. And then I did a show. Um, what was it? It was like a Zoom show at. Um, I think it wasn't until May that I did another show. I had Try. to do. I had to give a, a talk for Baruch College about comedy, um, and I was like. Oh my God, I forgot how, you know, it's, it was weird, but I did do a Zoom show. <laughs> oh, you know what else I did in June? I performed the first live out in front of an audience show was in June. Mm -hmm. This is from May to June. I mean, March to June. It was at a drive-in movie theater in Queens on the back of a flatbed truck. <laughs> the people were in their cars and the audio from my mic was going into, I brought my own mic, by the way, was going into their cars. So they were laughing by flashing the lights. And I was like, <laughs> I'm doing like car jokes, like, hey, Audi, what's your problem? Oh, someone hasn't been inspected in a while, you know, like just ridiculous. Like, oh, look at the Mercedes doesn't like my Holocaust joke. And it was so ridiculous, but I did, you know, we, one of the comics asked me uh, who I was talking to afterwards, um, who wasn't there said, did you get the feeling? Did you get the same feeling? And it was like, yes, I got something from standing there and getting some sort of response and, you know, being on a stage. It's people are, they're doing stand up. New York is a club in New York on the Upper West Side. They are doing daily shows in central park in in uh prospect park and literally under the trees and people sit on the lawn yeah. it's amazing do you get back to new york much i haven't gone into the city since march 7th oh okay it's there killing me because from my town you can actually see the new york skyline right um anytime you leave my town over skyline drive you see this New York in its entirety, 25 right. miles away. And I think I have no fucking idea. I just don't know when I'm going right. to be. I there. went uh, for two weeks at the beginning of June uh, after Memorial Day and then came back to Provincetown for a week. And then I went back for another week because it was my son. My son left for Tulane. He's at Tulane. He's playing basketball for them. So we had one last week in the city. I went to New Orleans. Uh, to drop him off and get him settled. And then I came back to Provincetown and I haven't been back. But, you know, I was there during uh, the the riots and, you know, the boarding up of, it, it was, it's sad. It's just really sad. You know, you live in New York City so that when you walk out of your apartment, you're in New York City. And there's no New York, there's no, you know, the museums and the, the theater. There's no, the, I mean, finally the restaurant's, are open, but it's not the same. Yeah. I'm hip. I got the, the guest who's going up um, a few episodes before yours told me about how she takes a subway from Washington Heights down to Chelsea to her, her art studio. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I, uh, I, 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 just I ride can't my bike it. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. 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 It's just, I know someday gotta... I'll get back to it. You know, but I just I, but I, don't, I you don't think, know when we're going to feel comfortable. Right. And it's like I was reading in The New Yorker that I'm in the middle of this article, but, you know, that after the bubonic plague was a whole other era began, you know, the Renaissance <laughs> was right after a plague. Yeah. I mean, who the hell knows yeah, what's well, going to happen? Yeah. 
Yeah, they they didn't have Facebook to uh, you know yeah. distract them. Oh my them, god, so. it's horrible, horrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the the podcast vein, though, I, I do want to ask, what has hosting a podcast for the last five years taught you? Do, wow. you, do you, are there things uh, you well, look at and say, "Wow, I," yeah, go on. Well, I it's a labor of love. It, I I learned it's taught me that you can't make money. Um, hosting a podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, my day job is, is <laughs> lobbyist for the pharmaceutical sector. Don't, don't get me wrong. This is what go. I do for love. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've learned that unless you're really lucky, there's no money to be made. Um, I, I've i always loved radio and I've always, you know, I guess because of my age, maybe, that I when I listened to comedy, it was on albums, you know? Um, hmm. And... I love interviewing people. I think everyone has a story. Uh, and I want to know that story. I don't care what you're working on. I don't, I mean, I'm not, you're not here to, you know, I'm sure there are times people are on because they are plugging something, but I am fascinated by what makes people tick and what makes people pissed off. Um, and I, I think if everyone tells their story, you know, maybe we could solve some problems in this world, but I've learned you know, you got to do a lot of research. Um, you can't go into an interview unprepared. Uh, right. Everyone, I, I've also learned through the, it's been a little over five years, you're right. And I feel like in that time, and there have been people around doing podcasts way before me, but so many people are like, I'm doing a podcast. And then they do it and they get bored or they're like, I can't keep up with this. And they stop, you know? It, yeah. it's, you got to love doing it. You got to love it. Yeah. And cause it's really, <laughs> it's very, you have to do everything yourself. Right. That's and, the, uh, oh, go on. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just saying there's no, there's no network executive telling you what you. Yeah. There's the freedom because right. there's no money in it. You can do whatever the hell you want. Right. The flip side is there's no money in it, but right. you know, we, we, we deal. Yeah. Uh, no, years ago, the greatest one I ever recorded was with this great author and, and TV Besides host and critic in, in England. Besides well, this is this now, one. once once we hit stop recording, this will be the greatest one right, I ever right, recorded. Right. Okay, of course. Go. Yeah, uh, so go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, the one I did with Cli this guy, Clive James, I recorded with in England uh, about five years ago. And he'd done worldwide. He traveled doing interview shows and, and you know, uh, various documentaries, et cetera. And I showed up at his place literally with this small bag with two recorders, uh, two mics, digital recorder, backup recorder, you know, a plug. And, and that was it. And he just, I can't believe you can do this. You know, when I was doing everything I did, I needed a whole crew, even just the right. audio ones. I had a crew setting up and you're able to just do this with that little bag. I'm like, yeah, right. that's, you know. They're pros and cons, That's you know, it, yeah. it lowered, lowered the barrier to entry, but you know, right. um, did you have a guest you kind of freaked out in terms of, holy shit, I can't believe this person's actually coming on my show. Or did you have enough life experience in the, the comedy sector? Not to be, you know, not to treat anybody with reverence, I guess. Um, there are people who I, you know, pinch myself like, oh my God, I get to talk to this person. Yeah. Um, I'm trying, I got to look at my list of guests, but uh, Dick Cavett. Um, oh my God. Yeah. You know, he was uh, Bill Persky, who was a writer for Mary Tyler Moore. And, and um, I think he also, Dick Van D I'm, Dyke. I mean, he was, he was really fascinating. Roberta Kaplan, who uh, was the, uh, she argued for gay marriage for the Supreme Court. Um, she represented Edie Windsor. Um, oh God, there's so many. Uh, uh, and whoever you forget is going to get pissed off that you didn't I know. Name them. I mean, so there's just the so many, like, you know. Um, you know, some of the live ones, like Alan Cumming, um, Sandra <laughs> Bernhardt, they're, they're just, the live ones were great, but of course, <laughs> they, they stopped abruptly. Um, 
uh, Isaac Mizrahi. There's just so many, there were so many great people and I know I'm missing, you know, like, you know, I'll get off and I'll be like, what? I can't believe I didn't mention this person, but whatever. Oh, you are going to hate yourself so much the moment we're done. It's, oh, you know God what, damn it, I should have told him, you know. I hate myself anyway. I'm a comic, you know, but, um, and you know, yeah. there's comics who have passed Beside on who I, I'm so glad I got to yeah. have them on. Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple guests who, I, well, a couple people I didn't get before they were gone, and it just kills me that yeah. either I let it go or I took no for an answer when I should have nudged a little more to to try to right. get them. But I know, and you don't want to you know, be nudging, uh, but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Oh, he's old. I don't want to be an asshole here, but right. you know, if I don't record to them now, you know, we'll never know. Yeah. Um, besides performing, which is your life. What else do you miss during this this crazy thing, this whole situation? You know, is there something else you think, God damn it, I really wish I could just go? You know, uh, so that's a good question. Um, you know, some there's part of parts of it I kind of like, but. Um, uh, as we talked about, I'm yeah. fine with with not getting on a train at five thirty right. in the fucking morning to go down to Washington. Right. I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, <laughs> I there's is there something I wish I you know I really do wish I could go to a fucking theater. You know, I really do. Mm. I wish there's some people I wish I could go hug. Um, it, it's. It's weird. Yeah, are you weird. are you physically affectionate? Are, I, are you I a huggy hugging. person? I'm a huggy. I'm a hugger. Yeah. I, did, I wasn't hugger. sure with the six foot plus thing. I thought right. you'd either be incredibly physical or completely awkward and, and unwilling oh, to. Oh, no. To, you know, I, my parents never yeah. hugged me. I can never, no one ever hugged me. I love hugging. <laughs> love it. You you and I have an awful lot in common. Uh, Speaking of, actually, something that, that occurred to me way back when we were talking about um, the, the celebratory trophy thing, when you see kids who have like, uh, you know, Kayla graduated sixth grade yes. and you see the big sign out in like the yard of the band, right. your parents never would have done anything like that, right? What, what Even about graduating high school or something. On, yeah. Right. My kid made the honor roll in the, in the bumper sticker. I don't fucking care. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And we were Jews. We were under pressure to do this. There wasn't right. a. We have know. to. There's no other way. But yeah, it's yeah. just so there. And, you know, and also social media, you can't live up to the life you present on social media. Like people, I mean, so many of my friends have the, like these horrible relationships. They're calling me, I hate her. I can't take it. I got to get out of here. I feel like I'm in jail. I mean, she's abusive. And then I go on Facebook and it's like, Happy birthday to the love of my life. I mean, it's like <laughs> people have created. Yeah. And here's the other thing. You can't lie. You know, when I was growing up, people had other families. You know, thank God for 23 <laughs> and me. People, But you could lie. Oh, I yeah. called. It was busy. Uh, you know. Yeah. I didn't I know who was home. calling, so I didn't pick right. up. Yeah. yeah. No. Hey, have you had any anyone you know discovered uh, they were part of a uh, anyone you know discovered horrible things about their lineage through twenty oh, three? Absolutely, and me? yeah. Because I ha I have someone who just okay. found out. His I, I had a cartoonist who found out his father yeah. wasn't. A yep, same yeah. thing. Uh, a friend of mine found that out. I was like, that's uh, 50, 60 yeah. something years old, and that that came out, and I'm like, yeah. wow, that's interesting. That's a, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know how you address that at this age. Yeah, <laughs> and do. You, do you have any sort of wish that, you know, it turned out one of your parents wasn't actually your parent or are you pretty okay with, with, no, who you I'm glad I had good parents. Okay. I, you know, I wanted my DNA to say, I wanted to be like African-American or something else, but it's just Ashkenazi, Jewy. I'm like 0.2% Sardinian. I was like so happy. But, yeah. <laughs> Somebody got out and played, I guess, yeah. you know, 300 years ago or something. Yeah, they, uh... Exactly. Nice. And any last words or messages you would want to give people under, should we say under 40? Is that, is that who we're worried about when it yeah, comes to the people under 40? Like, stop taking yourself so seriously. The world does not revolve around you. And every joke is not about you and, you know, lighten the fuck up. I guess that's what I would like to say. Lighten the fuck up. 
sounds like a good note to leave yeah, off on. Thank you. Judy, thank, thanks so much for coming on. Gil, thank you. You're a delight. And say hi to your wife. And that was Judy Gold. Her new book is Yes, I Can Say That from Day Street, an imprint of William Morrow. Pick it up from your favorite bookstore. It's a blast. It's hysterically funny. It is the polemic we need in this moment. Um, you can also check out Judy's site, judygold.com, for more of her comedy, her writing, uh, her coaching, her appearances in Provincetown, because everything else is canceled for now, and more. And that's J-U-D-Y-G-O-L-D. You should also definitely listen to her podcast, Kill Me Now, which, like this one, is a conversational show. Um Just give it a listen. You'll, you'll love it. Uh, it's on iTunes and everywhere else. And follow Judy on Facebook as The Judy Gold and on Twitter and Instagram as Judy Gold, which is spelled J-E-W-D-Y-G-O-L-D. And I want to thank her publicist for connecting us because this is one of the most fun episodes I've ever recorded. Now, in the before time, this is when I would mention my Patreon and PayPal and how you can show support for the podcast. Um, you can still show support for the podcast, but don't do it with money. Um, send me a letter, send me an email, send me a postcard. Uh, tell me what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show, etc. But when it comes to money, there are other people who are in a lot greater need than I am right now. So while I appreciate the gesture, uh, it would mean a lot more to me if you donate to food banks, freedom funds, other charities that are... Um, that are helping people right now, or to individual artists, creators, or other people who are in deep financial need. There are plenty of Patreons, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, etc. out there. And there are a lot of people in need right now. There are um, well, a lot of upheaval going on and people who are caught in the midst of it. And um, all I could say is, if you're in a position to help people, you should help them. Now, um, last note, I still have a couple dozen copies remaining of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. It's 32 pages of writing, poetry, a little, uh, photography, and podcast excerpts. It is not solely haiku for business travelers, although I, I get a lot of responses from people who are wondering why there's only a few haiku in it. Anyway, it is just the title. It is a compendium of me and my stuff. It's free. Um, just drop me a line or visit haiku for business travelers.com to get my contact info that way. You can kick in a few bucks if you want for postage and production, or you can send me copies of your zine or your comics or your writing or whatever. Um, this isn't about money making. This is just me sharing my art such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>